We've just spent several weeks talking about the structures of crystals. In the treatment so far, we've assumed that the crystals are perfect. That is to say, we have a unit cell, and we repeat that unit cell, exactly the same unit cell, infinitely in all directions, and we come up with a crystal. So in those kinds of crystals, there are no defects, and a perfect crystal doesn't have surfaces either. But in real life, Crystals do have surfaces, and they do have defects. And in the next few lectures, we're going to talk about the defects that we encounter in crystalline solids. Now, when you say defect, it carries a connotation, kind of a negative connotation, that a defect is bad. But in fact, many, many uses of crystalline materials are enabled by the defects, the colors of many gemstones rubies and emeralds, garnets, are derived from the substitutional defects in those materials. If we were to talk about phosphors that are used in fluorescent lights and solid-state LED lighting, almost all phosphors derive their luminescent properties from the presence of intentionally substituted defects. Pure silicon or pure germanium is not a particularly interesting material. But when we dope it, when we intentionally put defects into the crystal, that's when we can control the properties. That's when we get all of the interesting and useful behavior that make microelectronics possible. If we were to think about mechanical properties, we could talk about the difference between the mechanical properties of pure iron and the mechanical properties of steel. Right? And steel has superior mechanical properties and those properties come from the presence of defects in the iron. And then there's a whole class of materials where we are going to control the properties through the intentional incorporation of defects, like superconductors, like colossal magnetoresistive materials. So defects are essential. So let's talk about the kinds of defects we're going to encounter in crystalline materials. And in this lecture, we're going to limit ourselves to intrinsic defects. That would be the kinds of defects that you might have in a crystal that has precisely the right stoichiometry and no impurities in it. So here we see three possible defects. On the left, we see a vacancy. In the middle, we see an interstitial. Maybe one of the atoms doesn't go on the ideal Wyckoff site where it's supposed to go. Maybe it goes into a site in the unit cell that's normally vacant in between the atoms that are supposed to be there. And then on the right, we see a substitution. Maybe on a given Wyckoff site, we have the wrong atom. Now, the substitution one is something we would see in extrinsic materials, in dope silicon, for example. But we can also find these kinds of defects in intrinsically pure materials, where there are multiple sites. Think about a spinel like cobalt aluminum 204. The cobalt goes on the tetrahedral site, the aluminum goes on the octahedral site, but if there's a few atoms that switch, some of the cobalt goes to the octahedral site, some of the aluminum to the tetrahedral site, then that would be a substitutional defect, even though there are no impurity atoms now let's talk specifically about the intrinsic point defects that we find in ionic compounds. The thing that's specific about an ionic compound is that we have ions present that have fixed charge, and we have to obey the electroneutrality principle. We still have to have charge balance. So therefore, if we have the vacancy of a cation, we have to compensate that with the vacancy of an anion. And so the two kinds of intrinsic point defects we get in ionic compounds are the Schottky defect and the Frenkel defect. You can see on the left, a Schottky defect is a cation vacancy along with an anion vacancy. A Frenkel defect is a defect that happens when we take an ion from the site where it's supposed to be and we move it to an interstitial. So we can see in the drawing on the left, that there is a red circle missing from the lattice, and that red circle is not gone. It's just been moved to an interstitial site. 
And then yet another kind of point defect that we can get in ionic compounds would be that of a color center. So a color center is an electron that is trapped on the lattice site of an anion. So if we were to look at the mineral fluorite or the gemstone amethyst, that purple color you see in each case, that comes from the presence of color centers. So if you were to take a colorless crystal of fluorite and expose it to high energy ionizing radiation, you could create some fluoride vacancies. And as we see on the right, what happens is to maintain charge balance, instead of having a fluoride ion there, we just put an electron in that cavity. Remember that the anions in an ionic crystal are going to go to sites that are surrounded by cations. So that's actually quite a favorable place to put an electron. And the behavior of that electron is very much like a particle in a box that you learn in basic quantum mechanics. Or you could think of it almost like a hydrogen-like atom. And so the purple color there comes from excitations of that electron to higher energy states within its box. Now, now, this kind of defect would change the stoichiometry, right? We no longer have a perfect one to two stoichiometry of calcium to fluoride, but we have not introduced any foreign elements or impurities. You might think that as long as you grow a crystal in an equilibrium state, maybe you cool very, very slowly from melting or crystallize very slowly out of solution. We take great care to make sure that there's no unwanted elements or impurities that wind up in the crystal. You might think it would be possible that you could make a perfect crystal that doesn't have any defects. But even if you reach thermodynamic equilibrium and you exclude all unwanted impurities, there are still going to be defects present. And the reason why comes down to configurational entropy. If we think about a perfect crystal and where the atoms go in a perfect crystal, there's only one way to arrange them in a perfect crystal. Here I've drawn just a, a small segment of a perfect crystal. And so we have 16 atoms in this crystal. And to keep the perfect crystal, we have to arrange it in this way. You know, Think about the red and black squares on a checkerboard. If you put the red checkers on the red squares and the black ones on the black squares, there's only one way to do that. But once we introduce a defect, in this case, what we're going to do is to take an atom from the bulk and move it out to the surface. Okay, and, and once it gets out here on the surface, we still have the same collection of atoms. But now we've introduced more than one way that we can arrange the crystal we could move that vacancy around. And the formula for what the number of configurations is, is going to be given here. It's the number of lattice sites in the perfect crystal plus the number of, let's say, vacancies that are created by moving an atom to the surface, factorial divided by n not factorial times small n factorial. So if we have 16 atoms in this crystal, then the number of configurations once we have one vacancy is going to be 17 factorial divided by 16 factorial times one factorial. And that's going to be 17. Right? There are 17 different places that I could put that vacancy. Remember what Boltzmann taught us, that configurational entropy is simply going to be the natural log of the number of configurations times the Boltzmann constant. And so as we put these vacancies in, we're going to increase the configurational entropy of the crystal. How will that affect the free energy of the crystal? Well, the change in the free energy of the crystal that happens when we move that atom from the bulk to the surface is the change in enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in entropy. Now, the entropy term has two components. There's a certain amount of the entropy that comes from the vibrations of the atoms. And that will be slightly different if the atom is at the surface than it would be if it were in the bulk. And then we have this kT times the natural log of omega. 
That's our configurational entropy term. So if we were to plot these terms as a function of the number of defects, the number of atoms that have moved from the bulk to the surface, their concentration, we would get something like this. Delta H minus T delta S vibration goes up. It's positive. It is enthalpically unfavorable to take an atom from the bulk and move it to the surface of the crystal. And the reason why is because we're losing bonding. We do not recover all of the bonding that we get in the bulk of the crystal when we put the atom at the surface. Okay, so that is going to make delta G positive, which is, you know, thermodynamically unfavorable. At the same time, the configurational entropy is going to become more favorably negative as the number of defects increases. And so the overall delta G of this process is a balance between these two competing things. Now, if we were to take the first derivative with respect to the concentration of defects, N, we could do a little math that's gone through in the chapter that I'm going to skip over here and come up with an expression for the concentration of vacancies at thermodynamic equilibrium. And you can see it's a bit of a balance. The reason why there's a minimum in the delta G function, which is represented by this solid arrow, is because the configurational entropy goes down pretty fast at the beginning, and then more slowly as the number of defects increases. So the takeaway lesson here is that the concentration of intrinsic defects are favored when delta H is small, that is when we pay a relatively small bonding penalty to take an atom from the bulk and move it to the surface, and two, when the temperature is high, because entropy effects are always more important at high temperature. And maybe the biggest takeaway lesson here is that it is thermodynamically favorable for there to be defects in a crystal at some level. Now, if the bonding is very strong and you lose a lot of the bonding when you go to the surface, the concentration of defects might be very, very small. One other thing to keep in mind is that as we cool from high temperature, it becomes more and more difficult to actually attain equilibrium. So oftentimes we might have defect concentrations that are more reflective of the high temperature conditions when there's a lot of diffusion, and then we deviate from equilibrium as we cool back to room temperature.